Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's uh, a great pleasure for Hewlett Packard to be here again and myself um, to be introducing um, the speaker for today. Uh, we sponsor the ASPE luncheon uh, events, and I'm delighted actually today that it's um, actually out of Canberra. So, um, so I'm sure that was more to do with the minister's diary than mine. Um, but as a resident of Sydney, it's quite nice to actually spend a, a day at home, and uh, we've actually got some sunshine for a change. So uh, we've had uh, a few weeks of rain, so it's good to be here. Um, we're pleased to uh, sponsor all of the ASPE lunches. We're, we're a, a good partner, we believe, of ASPE. National security is very, very important um, to Hewlett-Packard. Um, we support um, some of the uh, world's largest security and intelligence and border security agencies, um, such as the Department of Homeland Security um, in the US. Um, we're responsible here in Australia for managing security uh, the, and securing significant amounts of uh, the critical infrastructure, of, but mainly around the economic infrastructure, um, a fact that you might not uh, all be aware of, but we manage uh, over a third of Australia's uh, credit card transactions on an annual basis, and we also look after a large proportion of the airline uh, reservation system, not, not the operation system. So if, it, uh, if your aircraft doesn't go on time, that's not our, not our area. Um, but worldwide, we're also a very large supporter of um, critical infrastructure in terms of data center and, and servers. And in uh, this world of increasing cyber uh, warfare activity, um, I feel we have a job, uh, maybe not as tough as the Minister's, but it is certainly a, a job of, of increasing um, importance to, to Hewlett-Packard. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Honourable Jason Clare. He is the Minister for Home Affairs, uh, Minister of Justice and uh, the Federal Member for, for Blacksland. Um, Jason was born and raised in Western Sydney, where he attended uh, Cabramatta Public School and Canley Vale High School before graduating with a Bachelor of Art Honours and a Bachelor of Laws from the University of New South Wales. Before entering Parliament, he worked as a senior advisor for the New South Wales Premier Bob Carr and as an executive of Transurban, one of Australia's top 100 companies. In November 2007, Jason was elected as the federal member for Blacksand and in June 2009, he was appointed Parliamentary Secretary for Employment and in September 2010, he was appointed Minister for Defence Materiel. He was appointed um, for Minister for Home Affairs and Minister of Justice in December um, 2011. I know from experience that uh, Jason always gets personally involved in all of his portfolios. Uh, when we were both in, in previous roles, and Jason was Materiel uh, Minister and I worked for uh, the defence company Talas, I recall we took um, Jason up to uh, Lithgow to see some of the improvements um, for the Army style rifle, uh, which is made by Talos. Um, Jason was not prepared to just hear um, Chris Jenkins and I talk about the great things about this rifle. He actually wanted to go and test it for himself. Um, and I should just point out for those of who actually work for Jason, he's a very, very good shot. So uh, <laughs> do uh, be very careful about that. So uh, I'm sure we're all looking for um, some very straight uh, shooting and talking from Jason now on the reform program uh, for Customs. So uh, without further ado, please be welcome. Uh, join me in welcoming Jason Clare. Well, thanks very much, Simon. There's no photographic evidence of that either, I'm told. Um, uh, to Stephen, my good friend Stephen Loosely and the team at ASPE, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Uh, Ken Moroni, uh, one of three members of the Customs Reform Board that I established last year. Great to have you here, Ken. Uh, Mike Pizzullo, the uh, newly minted Chief Executive of Customs and Border Protection, is with us today, and it's great to have you here for this important announcement and to be, to be working with you. In the room are uh, a lot of old friends, uh, people that I worked with in my time in defence, uh, and a lot of new friends as well. And uh, it's, um, uh, it's the right place to launch this big reform of customs and border protection. And uh, as Stephen said, Laurie Brereton, a, a good friend and an old friend is here as well. And uh, I'm very touched that you'd be here today. Uh, Aspie is Australia's leading defence security and strategic think tank and I think it's the best place to launch uh, what is the reform of one of Australia's most important security agencies, Australia's Customs and Border Protection Service. Uh, last year, just before Christmas, uh, Australia 
woke up to the news that four people had been arrested, including one customs officer for uh, importing drugs and precursors into Australia. And that morning, uh, a, a 20 year veteran of Customs and Border Protection went to the same coffee shop that he goes to every morning uh, wearing the same blue Customs uniform. The only difference that day was that he wore a jumper over his uniform. He was that ashamed, he was that disgusted and that embarrassed by what he'd read in the newspaper that morning and he rang my office to tell me. Most of uh, the people who work in in Customs and Border Protection, the overwhelming majority are good, honest, hard-working people and they often tell me that they bleed blue, that they bleed blue. And uh, no one was hurt more by that news just before Christmas than they were, that one of their own had betrayed the oath uh, that they had given. All of this saps morale, uh, it destroys confidence and it hampers teamwork. And it's not easy to fix. I know that from experience. Uh, a long time ago in a previous life working with Ken, uh, working for the New South Wales Government, I helped implement the recommendations of the Woodrow Commission into the New South Wales Police Force. And what that taught me is that reform is hard, it's painful and it takes time. It takes a long time to successfully implement, but it has to be done. I was, I was first briefed on what was happening at Sydney Airport in the first week in this job as Minister for Home Affairs now just over 18 months ago. I couldn't tell anyone at the time uh, what I knew or what was happening, but I set about then implementing the first stage of what are some very important reforms to the organisation. And I used uh, the work that Justice James Wood had done in the New South Wales Royal Commission into the police force there as uh, some guiding principles to help me. So last year I introduced legislation to introduce integrity testing and drug and alcohol testing as well as giving the Chief Executive Officer of Customs the power to make a declaration that an officer should be terminated for serious misconduct, as well as to issue orders uh, that making it mandatory for all staff to report serious misconduct or corruption. On top of that, I also doubled the jurisdiction of the Commonwealth Corruption Watchdog, uh, otherwise known as ACLI. Uh, until this Monday, uh, Ackley had jurisdiction over the Federal Police, Customs and the Crime Commission. Uh, that jurisdiction's now been doubled. So in addition to those three organisations, it also oversights Austrac, Crimtrac and the biosecurity staff in DAF, formerly known as the Quarantine Service. <clears throat> in addition to that, I also doubled the funding for Ackley to oversight Customs. But all of that, that Stage 1 reforms, was really just the start. There's a lot more to do. Customs requires major and comprehensive reform, and that's a lot larger than just the reforms to tackle corruption that uh, I've spoken about this morning and that I've been speaking about over the course of the last 12 months. On that, that morning in December, just before Christmas, I announced that I'd establish a customs reform board. And that board is comprised of three distinguished Australians, one of whom uh, we're, uh, we've got the pleasure of joining us today, Mr Ken Moroni, AOAPM, the former Commissioner of the New South Wales Police Force. The other two members are the Honourable James Wood, the former Royal Commissioner into the New South Wales Police Service, and David Mortimer, uh, a person well known to my friends here in the defence community, who's also the former CEO of TNT, the former Deputy Chairman of ANSET, the former Chairman of Australia Post and Leighton's Holdings. Their task, the task I set them, was to provide me with advice and recommendations to reform customs and also to, and this is very important, not just provide me with advice and recommendations but oversight the implementation of the reforms and their report, uh, which is on everyone's table, is the first report I'm releasing today. Just to give you an idea of the challenge that we face, uh, let me outline some of the big things that confront us in this area of border security. In the next few years, the number of people and the amount of cargo crossing our border is going to increase dramatically. The number of passengers flying in and flying out of Australia is expected to increase by about 8 million over the next five years. And air cargo, those, those packages that people receive in their letterbox or pick up at Australia Post or other places, that they're expected uh, to more than triple over the next five years from 29 million consignments a year 
right now to 95 million by 2017. And all of that uh, creates big challenges, big data challenges, more pressure on customs to move people and goods more quickly across our border. It means we have to modernise our business systems, our processes and our intelligence capability so that they're fit for purpose. The challenge, this, this challenge is not just more people, more cargo, more work. Uh, the work that customs does is also going to get more complicated. That means that we have to get our operating model right and make sure that our people have got the right training and the right skills and abilities to do this important job. We can also be sure of this. Uh, Organised crime is going to get more sophisticated and continue to find new ways to try and penetrate the border and the nature and the type of commodities that they seek to profit from is only going to expand in the future, aided by the speed and the complexity of new supply chains and travel routes. They'll also continue to try and infiltrate our border agencies and corrupt our officers. So the, the real question here is, how do we meet this challenge? The board's report, their, their first report, makes this very clear, and I'll just quote one part of what the board had to say. The board recognises the need for service-wide reform if customs is to keep pace with the rapidly evolving border environment. And meeting this challenge will require strong, effective and professional leadership at all levels and a commitment to ongoing staff engagement and effective change management. This is a view uh, that is also shared by the capability review that's recently been conducted into customs and border protection and I'm also releasing that report today. That work was led by Major General Mark Evans retired and conducted with the team over the course of the last five months. A capability review is a forward-looking whole of agency review that assesses an agency's ability to meet future objectives and challenges. And the work that Mark and his team have done has been very important and very helpful. It identifies the following areas that need critical attention. Leadership, workforce, business model, and enabling technology and innovation. And it also makes this very important point. The key to reform is cultural change. This is, this is, this is critical. Structural change is easy. Cultural change is hard. It's the hardest thing to achieve, but all of this will fail without it. Now, that requires the hard work and support of everyone in this great organisation we call Customs and Border Protection Service, all 5,000 plus, from the, from the newest recruit to the CEO to the 20-year veteran who bleeds blue and wants to believe in this organisation again. Uh, Mike, uh, I said you were newly minted. He, he's the new Chief Executive Officer of Customs and Border Protection, but well known to the people here at ASPE. Uh, Mike's been in the job now for almost five months, I, I think that's right. And uh, to meet the sorts of challenges that I've been talking about this afternoon, he's developed a blueprint for reform, and that's the third document that I'm releasing today. It's a very important document. It sets out a roadmap for customs for the next five years. And in it are three major tracks of reform. The first is integrity, the second is our people, and the third is modernisation. I just want to take you through those three, three tracks of reform now briefly. The first is integrity. Two weeks ago, I announced more reforms to harden our international airports in response to advice from Ackley and the Federal Police, and that included a ban on the use of personal mobile phones in customs controlled areas, tighter control over access to rosters, and tighter restrictions on access to customs control rooms. This report and the recommendations in it are the next step. There are a number of reforms in it, and I'll just mention a few of those today. The first is customs will establish a special integrity advisor. This role will manage the investigation of complex and serious cases of misconduct, including those undertaken jointly with ACLI. Uh, this role will develop and implement integrity assurance arrangements and ensure that our anti-corruption process systems are fair. Second, and you would have seen this in the newspaper this morning, Customs will institute fixed tenure periods for staff to mitigate the risk of corruption. Staying in one job for too long was identified as a problem by the New South Wales Royal Commission into the police service, and it's a problem that's been identified here. 
Now this change will apply to all customs officers now with different time periods depending on the type of role that they perform. The third reform I'll mention is the tightening up of secondary employment rules and the tightening of organisational suitability checking processes, our recruitment processes. So that's the first track of reform, uh, the, the work that we do in integrity. The second track of reform is what uh, we do to help our people and what we do to improve our operating systems and structures. First, Customs needs a new workforce model to provide a new career system that offers attractive and rewarding job choices. Career streams will now be built around four specific capabilities. The first is trade and customs. The second is a new border force. The third is intelligence. And the fourth is support services. Second, to, make, uh, to more effectively manage and deploy our offices and assets in this increasingly complex border environment, Customs will establish a strategic border command supported by regional commands. It'll, this new strategic border command will house the National Border Targeting Centre that I announced only a few months ago. And it'll also control and coordinate all of those specialist capabilities, including detector dogs, surveillance, advanced ship search and border technologies, X-ray, trace detection, field communications and cyber expertise. <clears throat> the regional commands uh, will be predominantly staffed by this new border force that I'm announcing today and they'll be deployed into regional and district command structures. The border force will be the visible front line of customs, a uniformed and a disciplined enforcement body undertaking functions across all border environments. These officers, the, the border force officers, will be trained and equipped to perform a range of tasks across all these environments. So gone are the days where you'll work at the airport for your entire career or you'll work at the port for your entire career. We need to skill up this force to be able to work in all of those different environments. This has been one of the problems that we've identified in the investigation work we've done. If you feel like you're trapped in the one job with no chance of promotion and only skills to work in one area, then that creates the seeds for corruption to occur. Third, we're going to enhance the fight against border crime by uh, Customs building a strategic partnership with the Australian Federal Police. And as part of this, Customs and the Federal Police will trial a new model for undertaking border crime investigations. At the moment, it's the Federal Police that conduct investigations of serious border crimes, including uh, the illegal importation of narcotics. And Customs investigates both regulatory offences and Tier 1 and Tier 2 offences under the Customs Act. So we're splitting that work up between the two agencies doesn't necessarily make sense. So we're going to develop and trial a new model where both agencies work together to triage the management of the investigation of those offences. And as part of that, we're going to second a senior officer from the Australian Federal Police, a commander, to take up and uh, help to run those criminal investigations. The fourth point here is training. Uh, Customs needs to change the way that it trains its workforce. It will develop a standardised approach to training across the agency. That includes structured pathways for learning that stretch from standard induction process, which doesn't happen at the moment, through to active career and continuous development to ensure officers have got the right skills for the job. And in addition to that, we're also going to look at the potential for establishing a formal customs training college. Now, this is, this is a lot of reform here, but it's a blueprint. Uh, and to put the meat on the bones, we need to work very closely with the key stakeholders in this area. We've already done a lot of work with our staff. A lot of the ideas in this plan are based on feedback from customs officers themselves. And when we get to q and I'll invite Mike to come up and Mike can talk to that in a bit of detail. Some of the best ideas in this plan are the ideas that officers have told us themselves. And we need to work now over the next 12 months with our officers with unions, with exporters, importers, airports and ports, traders, to help to develop and properly implement this plan. So first track, tackling integrity. Second track, helping our people and changing our operating model. The third track, and this is very important, is modernising our systems. Now this is critical to Australia's future economic prosperity. I made the, the point earlier about that massive increase that's going to happen in cargo and the big increase 
in passengers. And a lot of this is driven by the rise of Asia, the much talked about Asian century, as well as e-commerce, uh, people buying things online and sending and, and then being shipped to Australia or flown to Australia. Now to meet this challenge, we need to modernise and we're going to need to, to automate. First, customs needs to move beyond the one size fits all transaction based model and explore a variety of appropriate models for, the integration, for integration with traders, including direct access to some traders logistic systems for streamlined profiling and intervention. Ultimately, uh, customs needs full electronic data reporting for all goods arriving and departing our borders. As part of this, uh, customs will also work with industry to provide trusted and compliant traders with expedited border clearance where they have strong security and integrity practices in place. Second, we need to transform and develop our intelligence capability. Now, uh, you may have heard me talk about this before. I, I've mentioned it countless times. Intelligence, criminal intelligence, the information that we get from our own officers, from the federal police, from state police, from law enforcement agencies overseas, is the key to catching criminals and to seizing goods, whether that's on our border or whether it's on the street. And, and that's why a couple of months ago I announced the establishment of a national border targeting centre, a $30 million investment, new money to establish this centre, and it's based on a model that I've seen operating in the United States. Its job, when fully developed, will be to fuse together all of the information, all of the intelligence from a number of agencies, including Customs, the Federal Police, ASIO, the Crime Commission, the Department of Foreign Affairs Passport Office, as well as DAF officers, the former quarantine uh, uh, officers I spoke about before, and the Office of, of Transport Security. It's an important reform. It's a game-changing reform. The more intelligence you've got, the more crooks you catch, the more drugs and other contraband you seize at the border. It's based on a US model and a UK model, and it's one of the most important reforms in this plan. Now, in addition to that, Customs will develop a new intelligence framework, a new connected information environment and a new skills program to strengthen the capabilities and the skills of our intelligence officers. Thirdly, we need to modernise the way that we process people at the border. By the end of the decade, I talked about the Asian century, by the end of the decade there will be 100 million Chinese international travellers. Now this uh, creates enormous opportunities for all countries of the world but it also creates real challenges for customs and, and border protection. A big part of the solution here is going to be automation. Anyone here that's been to our international airports recently and has a chip in their passport would have hopefully tried and successfully used the smart gates, which you'll find at our, our international airports. There are um, a method that allows you to scan your passport and go rather than line up, wait in a queue to get your passport stamped. If you've got a chip in your passport, Australians and New Zealanders over the age of 16 can use the smart gates at the moment. The next step in this process is more gates and more countries, people from different countries, being able to use those gates. And plans are currently being developed to extend the use of these gates to citizens of the United States, citizens from the UK and citizens from China. The next logical step here is also to extend and use the same capability for when you depart Australia as well as when you arrive in Australia. And in February, I announced a trial of automated technology to streamline and automate departures from Australia to New Zealand. That'll involve a lab test of selected technology in a live trial at one of our international airports in the next two years. <coughs> Beyond this, we need to think about what the next generation of technology is next generation e-gates, because as soon as we know it, these smart gates will be out of date. That the system where you have a kiosk and then a face scan will be technology of the past. So we need to look at what is the next technology and make sure we're part of it. Part of that is looking at technology like face on the move and face in the crowd. Now all of this combined is a big reform program and will require funding to be sought 
through the normal budget processes. As part of this, I've asked Customs to prepare a two-pass business case for consideration of government ahead of the 2014-15 budget. All up, it'll take more than five years to do everything that you see in this blueprint, um, but the urgency of purpose that we bring to this task has to begin now, and it has to be long-lasting. There'll also be the need for further reform. I think, ultimately, that includes one badge at the border, a seamless, integrated border with all roles and responsibilities vested in one agency. There are things here that we can learn from the UK and, and from the US, but the first step is the implementation of this reform program. Now, as big of all, as all this is, and it is big, uh, it's only one part of a bigger reform program in my portfolio areas. This week, the National Anti-Gang Task Force began work. An intelligence team has been set up in Canberra and officers are now based in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane to set up the state-based strike teams that will commence work in January of next year. Next week, I'll officially open Australia's new anti-dumping commission that I drove through the Australian Parliament earlier this year. In a fortnight, I'll head to the United States for the first meeting of the Five Eyes Homeland Security Ministers with our partners, the United States, the UK, Canada and New Zealand. This is the first time that Homeland Security Ministers from the Five Eyes countries will meet. It's something that I worked on over the last 12 months with Janet Napolitano, the US Homeland Security Secretary, to establish, and I think that this will become an important part of our national security infrastructure and making sure that we learn lessons from our partners, learn lessons from what happened in Boston, learn lessons from what recently happened in London, and this will prove to be a very important forum for Australia. I'm also continuing to the campaign for national unexplained wealth laws to give our police more powers to seize assets from serious criminals. So there's a lot on my plate and uh, there's a lot to do. And I know this, the, the challenge that we face in this area of national security is always changing. Organised criminals are always trying to find new ways to make money, uh, new ways to penetrate the border. They're always looking for new vulnerabilities in, in the system and we have to be up to that challenge. That's why the reforms that I've announced today uh, are so important. Let me uh, finish with just a, a few thanks. First, uh, to Ken and the team at the board, thank you very much for all the work you've done today. It's not over yet. This is just the first step. Uh, there's more to come, and we need to make sure that these reforms are, are fully and properly implemented. Uh, second, to Mike and his team, and it has been a team effort in drawing all of this information together and developing this reform program. Thank you for the work you've done. Uh, like Ken, it's only just begun. Uh, there's a big, uh, big program of work ahead of you. And two gentlemen that aren't here today, but I want to say a special thanks to, and that's Philip Moss, the head of our Integrity Commission, and Tony Negus, the head of the Australian Federal Police, and their team, their investigators, their agencies, for all of the work that they have done, lifting rocks, finding spiders, making sure that we identify where the problems are and fixing those vulnerabilities, weeding out corruption and helping to make sure that it doesn't come back. And then finally to Stephen and the team here at ASPE, thank you very much for, for hosting uh, this important uh, reform program today and I'd like to thank everybody very much for listening. Thank you.